introduction to in, uh, information visualization we have uh, seen these uh, portion basically how uh, different way through networking uh, we could visualize the data we could and then we discussed about some prehistory regarding uh, some work by uh, uh, William Playfair where he has done a lot of uh, these representations and uh, there are some classic representations for instance this representation regarding the um, balance or uh, balance uh, against England and uh, Denmark regarding uh, uh, import and export uh, thing the areas basically tells you the 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 excess quantity of import versus uh, export say for instance import was la larger uh, larger for uh, the yellow line and then it sort of uh, it balanced against into in england when the export of england increased and then then the import which is there so then again this sort of a bath like uh, diagram which actually um, places different uh, people uh, statesmen uh, for uh, statesmen and um, um, men of uh, learning and their their area or their duration in which they they were part of history so basically you could compare in on the y axis you could compare who were what was happening in history de depending what was there like when uh, say for hannibal was there i i had other people who were who were involved or were there in pa other parts of the world and you could see try to find out a historical link between these people which is which is there here so the range or who has influenced whom and other things which is there you could also think about it uh, developing such chart for the freedom movement uh, of india for instance uh, this could be a good assignment where uh, you place uh, the um, the people uh, different historical fig figures maybe you can start with the first uh, battle of palasi uh, in mushidabad where um, where the british took over from there to uh, to sipai mutini rani of jhansi tatya tope uh, and um, these these characters and then you can come to the bengal uh, divide who were there in the, during the Bengal divide? Khudiram Bose, Sri Aurobindo, um, Barin Ghosh, um, then other other characters who were there, and then later on, as it comes down, it comes to the area where uh, you have Ga Gandhiji, and before Gandhiji, also Annie Besant and others. Sorry, others who started the Indian Congress and. Um, you have uh, the uh, um, emergence of Gandhi from South Africa into India, basically when he came to India to till his portion. And of course, after Gandhi, you have Shubhash Chandra Bose, you have um, Nehru. Basically, their, their regions of, of expectancies or their areas where they think and coming up to Nehru and up to the freedom of India. So this would be a good chart to make and you could try to see who, what were the overlap, where was Tilak, where was Lajpat Rai, where was the other uh, other people. Just wiki, wiki these information which is the time of work. See, uh, one you could say that from birth to death, you could tell that you could uh, get this information so maybe some people were influenced by the others were, who have who have been out there say for uh, for instance uh, bhagat singh how he was influenced so it should show you these uh, this information part in in this sort of a curve 
So it would be interesting if you could um, draw this sort of a curve. You could uh, maybe mark the thing, use an Excel or some other thing with with uh, basically coloring the sheet or or some some method of uh, of describing this this curve through Python. Also, you could basically draw these lines, and this is an interesting thing which you can sort of work work out. Well. Now, this was um, William Fair also tried to work out the uh, bar charts. So basically telling you some um, thing of income of uh, from Christmas to Christmas of Scotland. Um, again, export and import showing you how, how balanced or disbalanced they are. So you have got a black and a gray line. Which uh, which describes the two difference between between the the processes. Here again, uh, you have the pie chart which is explaining the Turkish Empire um, and how how much of which continent it made use of. So it had a portion of uh, Africa, Europe, and Asia. So basically, Asia was bigger, Europe was there, and a portion of Africa was part of the Tur Turkish Empire. So it shows the whole. The whole is the Turkish Empire, and the subdivision of the pie, or the pizza, you can say now. At the time, there was pie. Now it would have been pizza, and uh, pizza chart. So. Um, it shows you how much part of the land was Europe, European and how much was African and how much was Asia, Asiatic uh, in, in the uh, diagram. Well, um, we also saw how Nepal, Napoleon's conquest of Russia and how, how his uh, um, uh, army dwindled. And this gives you a beautiful uh, representation of of the these in um, in this uh, graph. Again, you have this network visualization. What is connected to what? So basically, try to this is extremely utilized in social networking and other places where I create links. Who is connected to whom? So the idea is that it is said that. Um, that if i if you want would like to reach anybody it is possible to with six hops to reach or connect to anybody in the world like if you want to connect connect to barack obama or or the or, or the present uh, president uh, joe biden or the prime minister of india is that you you can catch a friend catch a friend who would know another friend, another friend would know another friend and which can connect to to maybe the Prime Minister of India or may connect to the to, to Joe Biden or somebody else. So it has been seen that every person may have with the present networking possibility that within eight uh, six hops or eight hops you can manage to to get into touch with any of the um, people that you would like to contact in the world. So this sort of um, thing also helps in understanding the social networking, what is the clustering and how things are clustered. You could also design this network in a different way. For instance, uh, for example, there is a problem which um, my PhD student is trying to work out is that he uh, she is taking uh, data from the Sloan Digital Sky, which has got a petabytes of data which is existing. Now, from that petabytes of data, it's um, she is trying to determine the distance to the these galaxies. Basically, this is a Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is her, which is still surveying the sky, and it is publishing the data. And each time, it has huge amount of data where you need to actually accurately measure the distance. So they have given different uh, characteristics of the data. With that characteristic characteristics, you will either do a shallow learning or a deep learning. We decided to do shallow learning by with an uh, error reduction uh, mechanism. And using that learning, we actually try to 
train uh, the network and try to get get information of the distance of these objects now once i have i have the distance of these objects i i can break this distance in since i have the distance in polar coordinates i will be coming to coordinates later on what is polar coordinates i have the radial distance to the object and i know angular distance angular positions like longitude and latitude of the sky in which direction of the sky it is there with respect to the earth right so since uh, how we we mark locations on the earth through gps we mark it through longitude and latitude basically we have uh, divided the the longitude as 360 degrees and and the latitudes varying from 0 to plus 90 and um, 0 to minus 90 that is moving towards the north pole or the south pole so the longitude and latitudes have been divided so this is a polar axis which has been divided that way but in the sky what we have the right ascension and declination uh, they were little more cleverer what they did is that they measured the lo um, the longitudes in time zones right it measured in hours minutes and seconds because you know that in 24 hours the earth takes a total rotation so you have it in hours so you have so right ascension is measured in hours minutes and seconds while the declination is measured in degree again uh, if you go towards the north pole or the pole star it is practically at uh, plus 90 degrees uh, declination while the in the south pole of course there is no star associated uh, with the south pole Uh, it is at minus ninety degrees. Uh, um, this thing declination. So this is again at equator zenith is is zero degrees de declination. So with which we have actually marked the constellation stars and its position. Similarly, if we through telescope we see it very deep, we will be able to mark the galaxies and their positions. These galaxies are extremely far away. and you need to measure the distances and these distances don't come very e easily you can't measure them very easily the one way that you can measure them is from the hubble's law hubble's law tells us that um, the universe is expanding and the velocity of the expansion is proportional to the distance distance of the object so further the object the faster the object is moving away from us and uh, this is an observational discovery in fact uh, based on this observational discovery is your big bang theory and other theories which have come up basically uh, there is this is the big bang being the best theory which has managed to explain the hubble expansion extremely well so um, so basically this is an observed fact that you see the universe expanding and further the object it expands further away and this uh, different models have been tried to say how can further objects move far, further away how do you create this model this model can be created using a curved space model i'm not going into those things but using this uh, distances you can find the distance to uh, to the objects and uh, you know in which direction of the sky you're locate, uh, looking at and by knowing that you know the two angles so knowing this you can convert from this is a polar coordinate so two angles like longitude and latitude and the radius earth we don't bother because we we have the earth's radius as constant so we only talk about two coordinates over a, a surface which is obviously can be explained through two coordinates but then the surface is spherical which is the surface of the earth where r remains constant of course it doesn't remain constant r is different at poles and and that equator but we may assume it uh, as constant because we are not trying to drill into the earth or something we are trying to talk about the surface similar to the spa uh, space here you have uh, the sky so you you can easily measure the longitude and latitude the r distances are not easily measurable but in this case we do measure it using the redshift which is the sloan digital sky data gives you now when we i have the r theta phi i can always convert it into an x y z coordinate system and then i can use a quantization of delta x delta y and delta z 
and tell that uh, is the object in a particular box. Assume that I have a three-dimensional array and I can tell that if the object is in, in a particular box or not there in that particular box. How do you determine the box? You divide um, x by delta x, y by delta y and z by delta z and so which which basically delta x, delta y, delta z is the boxes the size of the boxes and you can sort of create this thing and you can then create a sparse matrix. I can say, I can talk about it as i, j, k value, a three dimensional matrix. i, j, k value has a particular object which is there. And so from reverse calculation, when I just say i, j, k and the object name, I can reverse calculate and say that, okay, the object is at this location, at uh, approximately this location with this um, uh, thing. Now, the idea is that once I have these objects, the idea is to create the neighborhoods. How do I find what is uh, what is the proximity to the, these objects if I want to create clustering? So basically, by uh, separating it out into this matrix format, I know if I've got this object here, I, I have how many neighbors? I have got eight neighbors uh, around the central square and I have nine neighbors above and nine neighbors down. So nine plus nine, it comes 18, 18 plus uh, uh, 18 plus 8 becomes 26 and so you have 26 neighbors. So basically what you have is a graph with 26 connect connects. So if a particular node is connected to all the 26 nodes, you say that it has all the neighbors. It is a filled, filled graph. But there could be, then that makes it a cluster head. Similarly, I could have another layer of, of material which is which is there and I could sort of say that this is a totally a filled box. So I can say that this is a filled box and there are objects in all the objects and I could consider them at a higher resolution and say that I've got so much mass in this particular box. Of course, but the universe is very uh, sparse and you, you will see that there will be <coughs> such boxes, mul multiple such clumping there in the universe, uh, like the Lanka cluster has been determined. Lanka cluster is nothing else but uh, the cluster of our universe, which which has been which was published in Nature uh, a few years ago. Um, there was a work by Indian uh, scientists at Ayuka, which uh, called it a Saraswati cluster. is one of the largest clusters which has been discovered and uh, which is much much bigger than Lenka cluster and uh, we, since it was discovered by Indians we we have named it as as Saraswati and as you know Saraswati Puja is also coming now and so so this is also a clustering which has been found but this work took 11 years to produce this clustering idea because it, this was manually checked and seen and done now with machine learning and using these algorithms of visualization. Now what I'm talking about is I'm creating this graph of visualization. I'm trying to, uh, each object can an, have an infinite direction of neighbors. Now to, to mark all this infinite direction of neighbors becomes very difficult. So instead of that, I make it into boxes and uh, by making it into boxes, I only have 26 neighbors. I don't have infinite direction of neighbors, but I have 26 directions around a particular box, which, which can be defined. Then each box will have its 26 neighbors, 26 neighbors, and this way you can uh, store it. And obviously you will not store it as a three-dimensional matrix, but you will store it as a three-dimensional sparse matrix. Now you will have to see in the sparse matrix, how do I search the neighbors? You will see that how you sort and keep the three uh, patterns that I have got i, j, k. So if my the least variable is i, then I will have the for a particular j, I will see what are the neighbors which are there. 
Okay. So I will have the k value which will be the thing, but I will be able to connect i with j, a layer, but not, sorry, I will be able to connect k with j, but not k with i. So you need to resort this uh, table in a different way so that you get a connection of i with k. I hope you get, get my point. So this is these are algorithms and this is the basically the problem of visualization and how how you simplify the visualization to extract more information out out of the data. So this is the example of network visualization which is there in short. So here uh, we have also seen how um, the maps you can separate out our agriculture or any, any other thing. This is a ma map of United States or, or the voting patterns or some other things. You can, you can describe it in this manner. So here you could expand uh, this, uh, this thing as maps of the market and, and show it. This is again showing you the immigration of work at work of, of general electricals, how you immigrate from what section to which section. This is a very interesting and a beautiful graph which shows you the details of, of this uh, device. Okay, so, so you have this sort of a graph. And we had actually uh, stopped here and uh, we had explained or we had tried to uh, visualize or tell you um, how this was a multi-dimensional uh, data where you have an X and Y where, uh, which is represented and then you represent the country or the location using colors and then you uh, explain the population using uh, circles basically the radial circle of it the size of the circle provides you an additional information which is there so you have colors position x y position colors and the size of the circle which determine information in this thing so you have got one two is the x y coordinate then and then the color which is the third coordinate and the radi uh, radius of the circle is the fourth coordinate. So a four dimensional uh, graph uh, is plotted over a two dimensional plane. So this is an interesting uh, aspect which is there. So, um, uh, so then we have seen that uh, you have additional examples like words, words, numbers. I um, there is an assignment which was given on this word count and other things which you need to, to plot or something. So visual com complexity. There's a book and uh, so fifty examples. Um, okay, so here uh, visualization component. We have said color, size, texture, uh, proximity. Uh, annotation, interactivity um, are the some visualization components that is used. Uh, then you can basically do a selection and filtering. You can zoom, animation. These come come into the picture to actually um, visualize the problem. Now, animation is. Now you need, need not have a, a, a static graph. It is possible sometimes now in the world of um, internet, you can actually share a YouTube video or, or a simulation on the net and you could just give a reference to it to your paper and, and say that you visualize it in an animation. So sometimes it becomes much more clearer to actually see it in animation or in three dimension. So um, later on, you will have uh, digital uh, journals, and in the digital journals, it is very easy to embed embed uh, um, videos or images. Like I will embed some videos in my presentation shortly. You will see some I'll see some videos. Okay, 
so here is uh, let me go step by step in info uh, wise uh, workflow pipeline so basically what you do is that when you first you acquire the data then you sparse the data you filter the data mine the data represent the data that is where you come and you represent your data you visualize it and then you refine the data and then you may interact with the data you may try to influence the data and and uh, and this thing so um, this uh, this table of uh, of methodology is basically adapted from uh, fry's uh, visual uh, visual data which is there okay now to sh give you an example this is acquisition of data so you have a set of set of numbers which are there and it it actually means it's gibberish this is from page 7 of fry's visualization so so basically it shows you this uh, this table now in this table i i do is that i sparse the data i specifically speak pick up some some strings and some values which is connected with uh, in the data which is there in the data so I'm, i take a sp specific values or specific columns or specific uh, rows uh, from this data and then try uh, extract this thing so that that is called sparsing means you sort of select select a portion which is there and then over the selection i i put a range of of the data i i filter or mine it i say that the if this data the minimum should be this maximum should be this so it should be between this minimum and maximum these are the ranges that i will i will accept anything above this range i will not accept and so on and so forth and and they they create this this thing now it comes to representation of the data here you see that this is the map of uh, united states and it is taken from this book it's page 10 and uh, basically it tells you over the over the map of united states how the data has been sort of placed or what is the th density of the data as you see there is a lot of density near new york area uh, uh, which is uh, the east coast of united states there is some amount of den density in florida as well as on on the other side which you see here which is the west coast also in the lower part you'll see a pretty amount of of density and there are densities which which are varying at different locations but the maximum density is in the new york region or the columbia region of of washington dc and of course that's the capital and that's where you have got density where you see here there is not much density here now this representation can be further refined of course i'm not talking about what refinement it has done it sort of refines it okay let me show it in in dark on this uh, the points as white and and so on so forth it's sort of uh, i can zoom into it and i can i can check this these values so this is refinement of the data from the plot data plotted and then i could interact with the data also i could try try and modify the data the way it would help me or be able to do it okay so so there are visualization software uh, host language c c++ java python uh, plus uh, opengl now most of you are uh, well versed with python opengl has been uh, with c now opengl can be also in linked with uh, python to give you a lot of uh, flexibility to to work on it so stats and maths packages with uh, graphics have uh, r matlab uh, MATLAB is 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 a paid software, so I won't say that you should uh, make much use of this uh, software. Python seems to be pretty good to to do that. 
so there can be a special purpose info with software like earth mapping uh, biological network visualization etc uh, then you have browser enabled graphics info package packages like uh, google chart um, process uh, processing and uh, processing uh, js d3 and uh, java which is the java flashes which were there in earlier days now coming back to representations okay so this is again history this is um, basically showing you how galileo uh, saw through the telescope and marked the sunspot in fact because of doing this experiment he he blinded himself because he actually saw the sun uh, through his through the telescope with his own eyes so he burnt his eyes and and at a, a older age he, he had he had become blind so but he made a systematic measurements of, of the sunspots how they they vary okay so in fact later on if you see um, it is important to note that um, during east india company there was uh, william petri and others had set up something called the madras observatory that that madras observatory then shifted to a place called kodaikanal this is in the nilgiris mountains uh, which is uh, in south of tamil nadu so this is near uh, madurai so uh, the railway station if you travel from uh, chennai to madurai Uh, the railway station to stop is kodai road and from kodai road you can um, you can uh, take take a car it's uh, sometimes known as the uh, switzerland of the south or the the mountains of the south kodai canal and uh, kodai canal if you go extended it goes to uti also kodai canal is a little higher uti it uti is very pleasant kodai canal is also pleasant so that's where the uh william petri set up the uh, first solar observatory in fact for last more than 100 years that this observatory has been photographing the sun every day taking an image whenever it wasn't cloudy it took an image of the sun and you have the largest longest longest database of movements of sun spots in fact uh, when i was a student at uh, uh, presently this uh, observatory is uh, run by the indian institute of astrophysics it's a center of indian institute of astrophysics i have visited this observatory myself when i was um, a student at uh, my research student at at the at indian institute of astrophysics uh, bangalore and um, we at that time there was a japanese group which came down to this observatory and uh, they wanted or they have digitized the analog photographs of all the sun sun spots or the sun's image taken over more than 150 years so so this data is certainly important this is important because it has it has a variation and this variation is an 11.5 years variation which is there you see the sun spots increasing and decreasing and somehow or the other uh, curiously this uh, this variation uh, matches very well with uh, kumbh mela and kumbh mela being in in alabad uh, it sort of connects to kumbh mela which is there in alabad so there is an 11.5 years of cycle or 12 years of cycle of the sun spots where the sun spots increases and decreases now what is a sun spot sun spot is are magnetic uh, storms on the sun so the sun becomes active when there is more sun spots and the sun becomes quieter when there is less sun spots so you see erratic weathers when sun spots are 
are large in number you see suddenly a day becomes hotter and suddenly again it becomes colder it, because of this appearing and disappearing of the sunspots and basically the sun is more violent in a sense so it its temperature or its uh, flow of uh, heat and charges are are, uh, are are more oscillating but in quieter phases when the less number of sunspot it is very static and it has a systematic he heating which is there so what you see is that over the years it has been observed that the sunspots have this 11 year cycle which is there from the data what is the cycle you see the sunspot forming at a little higher uh, latitude and slowly moving towards the equator and clustering towards the equator so this galileo first saw it and then later we we have this experiment of course, one thing I, I would like to make it clear, please don't uh, link directly the sunspots with uh, Kumbh Mela. Kumbh Mela is linked with the orbit of Jupiter, Vrihaspati, which is, this is uh, astrologically, basically the movement of Jupiter around the sun is about 11.5 years. So it is uh, linked with this. Now there has been, uh, there was a, a scientist who tried to connect the, the sunspots with the movement of Jupiter, Jupiter being the largest planet, largest planet. He says that is because being largest planet, it is wobbling the sun. It is because of its motion around the sun, the sun is wobbling because the sun is moving around its barycenter. If you realize when you have done the simple calculation of, of physics, you will see that uh, uh, you have, uh, you have uh, found out something called the center of mass. Every object moves around its center of mass. Since sun is so big compared to other planets or the earth, the center of mass of the system, earth-sun system lies practically on the center of the sun. So the center of the sun is itself, we say, the gravitational center or gravitational pull center. Right. But when you take bigger and bigger planet, the center moves out of it. In fact, if you have two objects gravitationally tied to each other and they are of the same mass, then uh, basically the center of rotation will be in middle of these two objects so each object will rotate around each other right around a common center which will may be out of the objects but in this case the sun being very big the center of rotation is still there but now due to this jupiter's wobbling it this that center is called the barycenter the sun wobbles right the sun wobbles and because of this wobbling it is said, it is thought by that, uh, by Gokhale, well, it was thought that it uh, could be that, uh, just, uh, just hold on, I'll, uh, I'm, there is a, okay, sorry, um, so, so there is this wobbling which is which is taking place and which is connected with the movement of Jupiter. But then this hasn't been proven. The paper had a lot of uh, problems and where things could not be explained properly. I'm in a class. Can you talk later? Uh, who is it? Ah. Uh -huh. Okay. So, so this is about uh, representation in of sunspots. Okay, so then here this is uh, work by Halley and uh, Palsky, basically uh, by traveling over the Atlantic Ocean, they tried to trace out the magnetic field lines and uh, what you see here is these uh, different field lines how this has been been plotted and uh, basically showing you the north atlantic or some anomaly which is which is there 
and due to this uh, portion. So basically it shows you the magnetic field line, lines of the earth uh, with measurement of their compass and uh, which can actually help in navigation. So what we say that uh, that compass always points north, it is not exactly true. It depends on, on some aspects of the earth's, uh, especially when you're traveling over uh, Atlantic Ocean, there is there is an, an Atlantic anomaly which is there, there in the magnetic field. Well, now this was uh, basically you're superimposing the uh, the magnetic field lines over over the map of the sea and uh, showing you how the field lines are varying over different locations so it pictorially uh, visually shows us in function of longitude and latitude is where is the north the compass will be showing in the in these regions of of the of the ocean Right, so this is an old chart, so where you have this sort of a diagram which which is which has been placed. Now this is from one of the recent uh, elections. So what you have done here is that uh, on the left hand side, on the left hand side you see is you see that uh, here. This is over the land. What is the seats while election? The sophologists have marked which have, which state or which locations or which MPs has gone to which party, right? Um, here you see that uh, it shows you this, and the same figure is translated and shown you an, in a semicircle, showing you a portion that you see that this much portion is a particular party in this case it is NDA the blue is UPA and this is others so effectively why is this semicircle chosen because the parliament is basically in the semicircle direction this is the treasury bench and this is the opposition bench so effectively you see it in this manner where you see the 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 number of people if if they were wearing some dresses some orange dresses the blue dresses or gray dresses it would they would appear in this way way if they sat in the parliament so and location wise you see you can get the idea of how the voting has has occurred so what you see is that you have a third front which is basically Andhra and Orissa has has gained on the third front. The South has sort of become more of remained with Congress. There has been some some pockets near near Mumbai, and there is this Punjab, a portion of Punjab which has gone into this uh, thing. And obviously, there is this dark blue which is coming in as BSP, which is basically concentrated over the Noida region. You see here the Noida region, which which gets the, this just uh, or the foothills of of Uttarakhand, and you have seen some pockets here and some pockets in Western UP, which uh, which shows you here, and some pockets near the Nepal border which shows you these dark blue blue spots so basically this is uh, bsp and other other things which is which obviously is there so this gives you a picture of how the people think or what the people whom the people are voting or it gives you a country wide separation or a divide which is, which which is basically visible here Obviously, you see here even Rahul Gandhi had to go down south to, to gain a seat because this is more sure shot of, for the Congress to get, get, uh, get uh, oneself elected. So, UP has been generally mostly orange, orange and dark blue and some sperm spots which is uh, Mulan's Green Party which is here. So this is a representation of the data on, on the map. 
so here again is the semicircular divide and it tells you the target of 172 if you cross 172 you have a simple majority and so it tells you here uh, gives you the idea this is uh, while elections are were going on so it tells you that the NDA has crossed the 50% mark obviously if they have crossed the 50% mark they are eligible to elect so they can have uh, have a two third majority what is meant meant by two third is that if you divide the semicircle into three portions right so and so they, the bjp may uh, may be occupying two third here in, it, in this case it is occupying just little less than two third which is there okay पंत मैं क्लास में हूँ थोड़ा बात बात करूँ अच्छा 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 मैं शैलेंद्र को अभी फोन कर देता हूँ या हाँ 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 ओके सॉरी सो दिस इज रिप्रेजेंटेशन ऑफ ऑफ आवर पार्लियामेंट व्हिच हैज बीन रिप्रेजेंटेड इन अ सेमी सर्कल बिकॉज़ दिस इज कनेक्टेड विथ हाउ how the sitting arrangement of the of of the par parliamentarians are from the treasury bench to the opposition bench which is there so this is uh, election result uh, 2019 trends at 11 am obviously these trends have chosen here you see the seats are pretty high and it is reduced to some 308 or so but it's more than 300 well uh, now this is another representation now using the uh, vidan uh, sauda where the parliament is of course uh, this uh, building hosts three three uh, houses there is a house uh, the lok sabha the rajya sabha and the central hall right so but uh, it is showing you in the full case which is there so which is basically a result of the lok sabha obviously later on uh, when the new parliament building comes up which is more in a triangular manner not in a circular manner and with again the three uh, three uh, three houses uh, will be marked so which is coming up on the side in a triangular manner and so then you would represent it maybe in a triangular manner. So that, uh, that is basically, so presently our parliament is in the, uh, in the uh, sorry, Vidhan Sauda is for K K Karnataka. This is, this, is Rash, uh, this is the parliament house in, in Delhi. So I, I stand corrected. Well, recently you would have seen such a map here. This is basically a map showing you the uh, the mishap uh, which happened uh, uh, during uh, 20, 26 January, basically showing you uh, what had happened. So here you see here uh, in, on this map, you visualize the location of Sing, uh, Sing, uh, Sindhu border, Tikri border and the Ghaziabad border. And here you see how the, the tractors entered into Delhi from different locations and it marks two different locations. One is the clash at RTO metro station. This is the clash where uh, one of the uh, tractors overturned and, uh, and, uh, and one of them were, was killed. And this created a huge riot. They said that the police had shot him shot the person but actually it was found that the police hadn't shot the person he he just tried to act smart and 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 uh, ram the barricade and by ramming the barricade he the tractor lost balance and and overturned and he died in the process okay the person young young guy here so and it also shows you the location of the red fort so how these people have have converged to to the red fort region and and created the 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 black stamp on india or the trouble which was created at at this location so what it basically does is that overlays on the map 
of Delhi, the locations where from where these movements have taken place have to create this this sort of a ruckus in Delhi on just last 26 January. So this is again a visualization of of the problem which occurred in that period. So newspapers and others have shown this data as visualization of this data. Visualization. So data is a hot topic. People buy and wear a t-shirt saying data nerd or data is the new bacon. True story. You can check it out online. With the digitalization era, data went from scarce, expensive, difficult to find and collect, to abundant and cheap, very difficult to process and understand. That's when the concept of big data emerged. Incredible amounts of information, so vast that they were challenging to capture, store, understand, and analyze with traditional software. However, all of this material is only as good as what we can make out of it, as individuals and businesses. Terabytes of data sitting in a data center unused is a burden. If correctly processed, it can become digital gold. Big data is often combined with machine learning to create predictive analytics or other analytics processes that bring the value of the information to light. Still, if you do not own a PhD in data science, the raw details can remain obscure. That's where data visualization comes into play. Data visualization is the process of taking raw data, transforming it into graphs, charts, images, and even videos that explain the numbers and allow us to gain insights from it. It changes the way we make sense of the information to create value out of it. Discover new patterns and spot trends. Think about a simple example. How do you create a story to tell your boss out of thousands of rows of data in an Excel spreadsheet? An easy way is to create a chart, like a pie or a bar chart, of that same data. Now you have a visual representation and can start analyzing and integrating it into your business, giving meaning and purpose to the original raw data. In the business travel industry, data visualization truly empowers travel managers and reporting users by providing clear and actionable insights into their programs. A data-driven program brings value to all stakeholders, from the finance controller to the security manager and the HR manager to travelers themselves. It allows for better control and prediction of travel spend and increases traveler security and satisfaction. Imagine if you could get a visual representation of your past, current, and future travel spend to show to your CFO, or if you could visualize the impacts of each change you make to your travel policies or negotiated rates. What about if you could see where your travelers are frequently disrupted and what would be better alternatives? The possibilities are endless and data visualization can keep you ahead. This was a crash course on what is data visualization. Well, uh, the other video which I wanted you to see, well, this is a small video. In the arrangement of visualization, every single pixel should testify directly to content. As Johnny Ive, the great Apple designer, said, we spend most of our time getting design out of the way. It's got to get out of the way because it's about the relationship of the viewer and how they reason about the content. Style and aesthetics cannot rescue failed content. If the words aren't truthful, the finest optically letter space typography won't turn lies into truths. There are enormously beautiful visualizations, but it's as a byproduct of the truth and the goodness of the information. The big steps in showing information began all with cartography about 6,000 years ago when the first map was scratched into a piece of stone. And that has wound up now with the most widely seen visualization in the world, which is Google Maps, where people are using a visualization to actually do something. The next big step was development of real science. Galileo got his telescope going. He saw things that had never been seen before. He made beautiful drawings of sunspots, and he watched the sun for about 40 days, and he did engravings of the sunspots, so he visualized what he saw. And so the history of visualizing 
data is very substantially a history of science. Data visualization is not just some airy-fairy creative process, but it's actually a very linear process of decision making that you can do based on some few basic principles. Three things should inform your design always. One is you as the designer, what you have to say and what you want to communicate. Two is the reader. That reader is not you and they're going to come with their own context and their own biases and their own assumptions and you need to account for that. And third is the data itself and what that has to say and how that informs the truth. There's a lot of subconscious brain activity happening. We evolved for it to happen that way. We evolved to see things and make snap decisions. Are all those lions in the grass just dried grass or is that a tiger that's coming to eat me? We have to be able to recognize those patterns right away and make snap decisions on them in order to survive. And that can be an advantage as a designer. You can communicate a lot of information very quickly because we all have brains that are designed to recognize patterns this way. But also, there's the emotional impact. We react to design and to art and to the aesthetics of a piece just as much as we react to the information contained in it. And so if you want to change someone's mind, if you want to change someone's behavior, sometimes presenting the information in a visual format is the fastest way to get them to engage with that information. Truth is one of those ambiguous things that you can't really define and probably changes and evolves the more understanding you have. Data itself is a result of research, so I would say that data is just a clue to the end truth. I think a successful infographic tells a story. It communicates hopefully accurate and sometimes complicated data in a way that many people can understand. I think the first step usually is always dig really deeply into the data ourselves and find each key point and create a hierarchy and a narrative out of that story. When you start to merge different pieces of information and when you start to learn really what it's all saying, the narrative is clear. The one key fact that everything can revolve around is the hero of the piece. There's one single piece of data or insight that people respond to and kind of encapsulate the whole vision and then invite people in to see the nuances and all the rest of the story around it. When you look at a piece, it's successful. When it translates data from something that's complicated to something simple, when it communicates a message that otherwise would have taken somebody hours to digest and find in an instant. My deepest interest lies at the boundary between data and culture. Data are measurements of something. In very many cases, those some things that we're talking about are human systems. We're dealing with data systems that are larger than anything that humans have ever built or experienced before. And these really large systems, things happen within them that are emergent. For example, gate change can bind shot footage from airports for pretty much every airport in the world, and then air travel data as well. So the central idea was to show people that every time that you're in an airport, you are standing on the surface of a system that is almost too complex to comprehend. At any given time, there are more than a million people in the air. And so there's another purpose of data visualization. There's revelation, which is show us something that we've never seen before. This is, for me, much more exciting. Anybody can visualize data in Excel and see some bar charts. For me, it's about showing them something in this kind of loose narrative frame that they can interpret. So we show them some pieces of the picture, and the idea is that they can sort of stand back from that and watch it pass for a little bit and come out of it with some deeper understanding. Part of it is leaving it open to interpretation, but part of it is also not really knowing. I don't have some masterful understanding of this system that you don't. I have some ideas about how these systems might be changing and how they might be growing and how they might be important to our culture and society. And I want to share some of those ideas with you and maybe you can put together something that I wouldn't have been able to put together. 
I think in general audiences are a lot smarter than a lot of people think. So it's not know your audience, it's respect your audience and really know your content. That's what you should be knowing and reasoning about. Look after truth and goodness and beauty will look after herself. You want to see to learn something, not to confirm something. We usually see to confirm things. It's very economizing for the brain. How can we see not to confirm, but to see to learn? Mm -hmm.